I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast. Rob, today we have another special guest for our Lucian series. Yes, we do. This is James Monroe Taylor Chair of Philosophy at Vassar College, Brian William Van Norden. That's a lot of, of things in one sentence. Professor Van Norden has done a heck of a lot of stuff. Just in terms of the podcast, in 2019, Professor Van Norden, we interviewed you for the publication. This is in BC before COVID times. We interviewed you for uh, Classical Chinese for Everyone, a, a short textbook aimed at a more general audience learning classical Chinese and kind of making classical Chinese approachable for a much wider audience. You've also just recently published the audio book of The Introduction to Classical Chinese Philosophy, which was a 2011 book that now has become an audio book. Obviously, our audiophilic audience, we'd highly recommend y'all check that out. Professor Van Norden, thank you so much for coming back on the show. Well, thank you again for having me. I had a great time last time. And when I heard you were doing a Lu Shun series, I've taught Lu Shun in my classes for many years. And in fact, I first read Lu Shun in Chinese as an undergraduate when I took third year Chinese with Victor Mayer at the University of Pennsylvania. And I was just so blown away. I remember thinking that even if I never used Chinese for anything else, it would be worth it just to have been exposed to Lu Shun because I enjoyed his short stories so much. And now I've got a, a forthcoming article on Lu Shun, The Sanity of Insanity, Lu Shun's Diary of a Madman, uh, in an anthology on appreciating modern Chinese literature classics coming out from uh, Nanjing University, uh, Chuban Shi, um, in both English and Chinese. And so what, I was just really happy to come on. And you, I know you already have somebody talking about Diary of a Madman. So I suggested we might talk about uh, another great short story by Lu Xun, Kong Yiji. I'm super excited to be able to discuss Kong Yiji because Kong Yiji was actually the first story that I read in Chinese when I was at BYU studying for the, the Chinese flagship program. Kong Yiji was, was one of the first things that I had to to do. And and it's funny, I haven't really read it since then, and my Chinese was really, really crummy at the time. Coming back to this story and reliving it has has been a, a great experience. You mentioned, Brian, having talked about Diary of a Madman, there's AQ, there's, there's sort of the classics, right? And then there's the ones that aren't necessarily included in the anthologies, but that to some extent really show Lucian's range a lot more than even the classics. You know, Lee and I have one podcast dedicated to my favorite Lucian short story, which is White Light. You're, you're sort of giving me the nod. I don't even know if you've read it, but it's bizarre and fascinating. But for me, is if, if I was asked as a guest to be on a Lucian series, that would be the story I choose. So maybe this would be a good place to just, to just jump in because I am curious why this story, out of all the Lucian stories we could have discussed, why this one? Yeah, well, I, I think... It, and again, I've taught this with my students for many years. Uh, it's, as you probably know, Kung Yi Ji is supposedly Lu Shun's favorite of his short stories. It's very brief, barely six and a half pages in English translation. And I think an, you know, intelligent rest, Western reader could read it and get something out of it. But it's packed with cultural references that most Western readers won't get. But when you decode them, the story takes on all these deep layers of meaning that are not obvious at first. Now, I listened to the first in your of podcast in your Lucian series. I thought it was great. And I think in particular, um, the discussion of the significance of science fiction for Lucian was, was terrific. And, uh, but, but some of the background you need to understand, uh, Kung Yiji is the fact that Lu Shun is part of this generation, which is part of the new culture movement. And as the name suggests, and I know you know this, but our, our listeners may not, the new culture movement was mostly younger Chinese people who thought that China needed a new culture to replace traditional Chinese culture, Confucianism in particular. This is often referred to as the May 4th movement, but interestingly, May 4th happens a few months after the publication of, of Kung Yi Ji. 
Another part of the May 4th movement was the trend to write in vernacular Chinese instead of classical Chinese. And as you know, that's one of the reasons Lu Xun's stories are so significant, that they are early examples of vernacular writing. Lu Xun's Diary of a Madman is often credited as the first vernacular short story. But of course, uh, a female author and actually a student at Vassar, Chen Hengzhe, actually published the first vernacular Chinese short story in 1917, a year before Lu Xun's Diary of a Madman. But she published it in, in an overseas Chinese journal, so it didn't get as much uh, attention. Now, when you, you get all the cultural reference points in Kung Yiji, we can go through those, you realize that Kung Yiji in many ways is a symbol of the Confucian tradition and how decadent and socially irrelevant it is. Although the way the other characters in the story interact with Kung Yiji also points out social problems that Lu Xun thinks are endemic to traditional Chinese culture and that he's criticizing. So again, it's a, it's a, you can get something out of it without knowing the cultural background, but when you realize a few cultural posits and a few key terms and what they mean, the story gets a kind of depth as a critique of traditional Chinese thought that wouldn't be obvious to the uninitiated reader. Before we jump into those connections, I, I was wondering, Rob, can you just briefly summarize for, for the listener the, the story of Kong Yiji? Professor Van Norden, you, you mentioned it was incredibly short, so even Rob can do it, right? <laughs> even even I can handle a brief <laughs> summary. I'm not known for brevity. When, when, you, when you ask for brevity, you don't usually go to me on the podcast. <laughs> but it's interesting. It's, there's a lot of Lucian stories like this. When asked to summarize, you either have to give someone one sentence or six pages. There's there's once you start getting into details, you get lost. It's that way with AQ Dyer and Madman. So I'm just gonna give the capsule version, which is this is a story of a guy named Kong Yiji, who is effectively a failure. He he is put forward as a classical scholar, but someone who never passed the exam. Now the whole story, such as it is, takes place in a local tavern. And the narrator is someone who also is sort of a failure. His job is just to warm wine for patrons. And Kong Yiji comes in and usually with money gained through theft or some other nefarious process is able to buy a few cups of wine and some some nuts. And everybody makes fun of him because he just can't function. He, he, he can quote the classics, but he has no comebacks to people's statements. And so everybody loves when he comes there because they get to make fun of him. But because he can't hold down a job and because he steals books and things from the people he works for, his life sort of goes downhill. By the end of the story, he's had his legs broken because he stole from the local magistrate. He goes back into the bar one more time with his legs broken. Everybody makes fun of him. And that's effectively the end of the story. Now, as I said, way more is going on in this story than that. But that's the, the brief capsule version. Professor Van Norden, I wanted to ask you something. Rob, that was great. I wanted to ask uh, you something and correct Rob simultaneously. Rob said that the character's name is Kong Yiji, but that's not entirely true, right? His his last name is Kong, but Yiji is, is just the first characters of a... Uh, kind of ABC primer, whatever. I mean, you know, the classical Chinese equivalent to that is what's going on with that name? Yeah, great, great question. And, and yeah, great <laughs> summary, uh, Rob. But uh, but your uh, the fine point you're making is is well taken, Lee. The I, I don't want to say hero because there are no heroes in Lu Xun's stories. There are main characters, but there are no actual heroes that we're rooting for. We might feel sorry for them, but we don't root for them. But the, the main character, his surname is Kong, and the people in the bar either don't know or don't care what his given name is. So they call him Kong Yiji, which are three characters taken from the opening of kind of a, a short primer uh, that's used to teach children their first characters in traditional China. In the spirit of the pedantry of Kong Yiji, um, a guy who takes the scholarship too seriously. When my children were growing up, I had this primer written on the wall of their nursery. And so they, we memorized together the first few characters, which go Shang Da Run Kong Yi Ji. 
And you can kind of <laughs> read them as saying something, but they're basically just really simple characters that you might learn first. And so basically they're calling this guy something like Mr. ABC. They don't care about his real name. But one of the cultural touch points that's very obvious to Lucian's audience, but is lost on most English readers, is that the name Kung is the same as the surname of Kungza, better known in the West as Confucius. And in addition, this story takes place in the town of Lu, which of course is part of the pen name of Lu Shun, but more importantly, Lu is traditionally the home state of Confucius in ancient China. So we're mm-hmm. set up to think that this guy, Kung Yi Ji, represents Confucianism in contemporary China. And then when he's introduced in the story, and this is a, a, it's partially my own translation, partially modified from some of the other translations out there, it says, although he wore a long gown, it was dirty and tattered and looked as if it had not been washed or mended for over 10 years. When he talked, his mouth was full of, lo, forsooth, verily, nay. So it was impossible to understand half of what he said. As his surname was Kung, people nicknamed him Kung Yi Ji after the opening characters in the children's copybook. And so there's a wealth of things in there. A Chinese audience is going to know, oh, this guy's got the same name as Confucius. I borrowed that loose translation, Lo, Forsooth, Verily, Nay, from uh, the translation by Lyle. Uh, which is a way of rendering the fact that this guy's always spitting out classical Chinese expressions and classical Chinese characters that you don't use in ordinary language. It's kind of like somebody who insists on peppering their conversation with Latin expression. You know, if somebody did that today, I mean, I would think it was cool because I'm a nerd, but most people would be, well, what a jerk, you know, like you're just trying to talk down to us by throwing in all this Latinate stuff that we can't understand. And so they just call him, you know, Kung Yi Ji or Mr. ABC as like a way of denigrating him. And instead of being impressed by his scholarship, people just laugh at him mercilessly because he is a failure, but he's a pretentious failure who takes the Confucian tradition really seriously. And that shows in Lu Xun's eyes how ridiculous Confucianism is as a movement, even though there are still people who take it seriously. It's interesting that you mention that because one of the things that struck me reading the story is that with most Lucian stories that involve a classical scholar, there's more than one way to read them, right? So this one, the guy is, as you mentioned, he's a, he's a classical scholar, but I'm wondering to what extent we are meant to read him as representative of the Confucian tradition because he failed the exams. He is a pretentious fop. Uh, he's all the things that Confucian scholars are not ever supposed to be. Effectively, he's he's a failure. So to what extent is he supposed to represent the Confucian tradition? And to what extent is he supposed to represent a failure of the tradition? That's a that's a great question. And this is in many ways central to the the dialectic of the of the new culture movement. Because people like the later new Confucians or some of the more cultural radical in their own way, but more culturally conservative people like Kang Youwei would say, well, what we need is to understand the Confucian tradition in a deep way. The problem is that people haven't understood the true significance of the tradition and haven't really lived up to it. And in fairness, one of the contexts in which I've used this short story is at the end of my course on later Chinese philosophy, where we focus on Chinese Buddhism and Neo-Confucianism. And then to give them a sense of the later trajectory of the tradition, I have them read this short story. I have had students who said, oh, I get it. This story is criticizing people who say they're Confucians, but don't really (laughs) understand it. But I, I think for people in the new culture movement, and again, they're People like Husher, who's also in this movement, they have nuanced views about the tradition, but largely they're critics of the tradition. They're not saying, oh, the problem is we didn't really understand the Confucian tradition or didn't live up to it. That's what people said in previous dynasties when a dynasty came to an end. They're like, well, we just need to live up to the tradition better. But part of what's distinctive about the crisis that China is in that leads to the end of the Qing dynasty and the end of the imperial system 
And that it seems to a lot of people like the problem isn't that we haven't lived up to or genuinely understood the Confucian tradition. The problem is the Confucian tradition. So I, my guess is for Lu Xun and most of his contemporaries, they'd say, no, Lu Xun is really what Confucianism is about. You're right. He hasn't passed even the lowest level of the examination. There is another Confucian scholar who does pass the examinations. And this is the scholar who in the story takes Kung Yiji and has him beaten and has his legs broken because Kung Yiji stole from him. And one of the characters in the story says, well, how are you going to steal from a guy like that? And so the only difference as Confucians between Kung Yiji and this guy who's actually passed the examinations is that the guy who's passed the examinations has the wealth and the political power to have other people beaten and made disabled as a result of his whim. So in many ways, the Confucian tradition, for according to the perspective of Lu Xun, is really about who's got power, the people who are in the long gown group, the wealthy customers who get to eat and drink in the back room, and the, the short gown people, the ordinary everyday workers who are largely illiterate, um, and then people like Kung Yiji, who has to eat with and drink with the, the short gown people because he hasn't passed the examinations. So for, for Lu Xun, really Confucianism is just this social mechanism for giving people power. And, and by the way, I think one of the reasons it's important in the story that Kung Yiji has not passed even the lowest level of the examination is that if you pass the lowest level of the examination, people can't beat you without a judicial order. But if you're just a common person, a person who's passed a higher level examination can certainly beat you and break your legs. There's not a thing you can do about it. Why don't we institute a system like that in the U.S. where people with PhDs <laughs> can't get beaten without, you know, just for... <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah. You know, not to, not to get too political about this, that's not enshrined in the law. But of course, you know, the way you're treated, if you've got the social status of having a PhD, um, is very different from the way you're treated if you're someone else. And I, I'm aware, as you're aware, the United States, I love my country, but it's a very anti-intellectual country in a lot of ways. But still, I have a colleague uh, at Vassar who's African-American, and he was pulled over by the police and when he flashed his Vassar faculty ID card, all of a sudden the officer started treating him differently. So the kinds of problems that Lu Xun is talking about differ in their details from society to society. But we do have analogs of that. The special treatment you get, either on the basis of race or social class, is a phenomenon that we see in the United States as well. And one of the things that I think we're we're hoping to do with this series is think about how <coughs> Lu Xun applies to the U.S. Because that's one of the, I mean, not specifically to the U.S., but to all of our listeners, because we have we have listeners throughout the world and, and we shouldn't restrict ourselves in our thinking as we often do to the U.S. But when your students read Kong Yi Ji, what do they take away from it? Well, I often use it to explain the transformation in attitudes toward Confucianism and traditional thought at the, the beginning of the 20th century. So I tend to focus on that. But I, I think you can take lessons away from Lu Xun in general and his short stories for other societies. So like in Diary of a Madman, the narrator realizes that he and everyone else in society is a participant, whether they like it or not, in a system in which you have to exploit others in order to survive. And that is something that happens in other societies besides traditional Chinese society. Here in Lu Xun, the fact that there is corruption and clear class distinctions, the way those are marked in traditional China is in terms of, do you wear a long gown, like a scholar's gown, or do you wear a short jacket like a worker? Or if you're Kung Yi Ji, are you in this kind of liminal space where you're wearing a scholar's gown, but it's dirty and tattered and you have to eat 
with the, the poor workers. In England, uh, one of the ways that class is marked is by accent. And so people in England will take classes to lose their regional accent and to develop a posh accent that will mark them as a member of the social elite. In the United States, we identify class in terms of what kind of clothes you wear. Um, often, we also have racial distinctions that will allow people to treat you differentially. But as I, as I mentioned, also, when people meet me, they usually guess I'm a teacher or a college professor, and they're going to treat me a certain way because I've had, I have that status. Um, I, I also wanted to make sure we mentioned at some point, in the opening of the story, Kung Yi Ji, we learn that the narrator works in the Shen Heng Zhou Dian, which we might translate as the prosperity for all tavern. But that's kind of ironic. We're saying there's prosperity for all, but then we're immediately told, well, there's the part of the bar where you go if you're in the short jacket crowd. And then there's the back room where you get to sit down and enjoy yourself if you're part of the long gown crowd. And we also learn that the narrator's job, his official job initially was to cut the wine. That is to say to water down the wine before it's heated. But he wasn't good enough at cheating the customers to get away with that. And in one of my favorite lines in the short story, the narrator explains, but the person who recommended me for the job was too important, so the boss couldn't fire me. So Lu Xun is saying that in China, corruption is so corrupt that you can't even do it efficiently. You can't even fire somebody for being an incompetent crook because the person who recommended them is too influential. And then the narrator says, you know, it was really not a pleasant job. The only time I ever smiled was when Kung Yi Ji came into the tavern. And one of the things I love about Lu Xun is he's so good about these shifts in mood and surprising you by shifts in mood. So the story starts out kind of sad and dismal. And then you hear that we're about to meet this guy, Kung Yi Ji, that leaves everybody with a smile. And so you're prepared for a story about a heartwarming guy who makes people happy with their kindness and wit. And then you immediately learn, oh, everybody loves when Kung Yi Ji comes in because we humiliate him and we laugh at him and we mock him and everybody bonds over humiliating this poor sad sack of a guy who's got scars from being beaten regularly and has a drinking problem. That's the source of the joy in the story. And that's part of Lu Xun's message. Yes. And in fact, I have to read this line because it's, it's the one that I would thought, I would thought you were going to mention, but this is my single favorite line in the, in the, in the story. I'm, I'm using Lovell's translation, but it says, and so it was that Kong Yi Ji spread joy wherever he went, though when he wasn't around, we barely missed him, which is such a perfect encapsulation of exactly like, what a great guy. Actually, we don't really care. I have to throw this in there because the question, this is the question when I read this story, the one I really wanted to throw at you the most, which is with whom are we supposed to sympathize, if anyone, in this story? Because there isn't a single person in the story who isn't a horrible human being, from the narrator all the way up to the boss. No one is good. Like, no, I don't read any character and go, yeah, that's the person I'm supposed to think about. There's, there's nobody. So I'm curious if, is there anyone that we're supposed to latch on to, do you think, for some reason? Or is it part of the story's particular genius that, nope, everybody's just washed up? Yeah, I think this is a general feature of all the stories by Lu Xun that I'm, I'm familiar with. There are people that we might feel sorry for, but those people are not heroes. They're not protagonists in the sense that we're rooting for them. And you can, of course, have a flawed hero, and usually those are the more interesting heroes, the ones where you're like, well, I'm rooting for them, although I also see they're a problematic person. But you don't even get that in Lu Xun. So yeah, Kung Yi Ji, we feel sorry for him, but he is also a petty thief who was washed out of being a copyist, the only career he was ever any good at, because he keeps stealing to support his drinking habit. And I think it's probably significant that uh, Lu Xun's father also had a drinking problem and that contributed to his early death. And I've always wondered, I've never 
found anything to confirm this, but in Book 10 of the Analects, in a description of the behavior of the historical Confucius, the historical Kongze, it says that when there was plenty of food, he would not overeat. Only in regard to wine did he have no limit. Way joke, and beyond. <laughs> And so I wondered if Lu Xun knew that line and was like, yeah, I guess, you know, uh, Kung, the historical Kung Tzu was kind of a drunk or two. It almost sounds like you're suggesting that maybe we can read Kung Yiji as kind of a possibly a metaphor for the real Kung Tzu translated into early 20th century Chinese culture and how, how bumbling he would be. I think that's right. And I think the – you know, in place of this image as of Kungza as a sage that we all admire, new culture figures like Lu Shun are asking us to re-envision the Confucian tradition. It's it's kind of like people in, say, American culture who criticize Christianity or give re-envisionings of Jesus in a way that are unflattering. That's often shocking to people, but you know, there is a, a point in doing it if you want to challenge traditional institutions and the value of traditional institutions. And so something – it was shocking to people in China, many people, to think of Confucius in this way. But I think that is what Lu Xun is, is asking us to do. That's why the characters got the same surname as Confucius. That's why the town is – got the same name as Confucius's hometown. The question – of fakeness and truth and realness seems to hover over this story because we, we know Kong Yiji is not his real name. We don't know what his real name is. There is this question of the wine being watered down. Uh, is it real? All of these things are something that I see more broadly in, in Lu Xun's work. I mean, if you think of uh, Diary of a Madman, there's this question of who do you actually believe? There's this basic epistemological question. What is Lu Xun doing with this question of, I don't know if it's reality or authenticity, I don't know what to call it, but you know, what do you what is he trying to do there? That's a that's a wonderful observation. Yeah, this this issue of the difference between reality and illusion is a theme throughout Lu Xun's work. It it's one that he's always playing with. I mean, you mentioned Diary of a Madman. Part of what I think is is fun about reading that story is, at least how I read it, is the narrator of Diary of a Madman is insane. He mistakenly believes that people are trying to literally cannibalize him. But his delusion about his society gives him a perspective from which he can see the fact that, according to Lu Xun, Chinese society is predicated upon metaphorically devouring other people and exploiting them. And then at the end of Diary of a Madman, when the narrator goes sane, so to speak, his becoming sane is a snap that occurs when he realizes that he is implicated in the exploitation of others. And going sane means becoming the kind of person who can ignore this fact and participate in society, which is why we learn that supposedly the narrator went on to assume a traditional uh, position in the civil service system after recovering from his illness. But recovering from yeah. his illness means no longer seeing what's actually going on in society. And you see the same thing in like the true story of AQ, where the character is misinterpreting situations he's involved in repeatedly. So I think this is a a really a theme that Lucian's very aware of. If I can add one more thing, I know we're almost out of time. I like to think about Lucian's short stories in comparison with James Joyce's Dubliners, because I think we have these two early modern authors who have a love hate relationship with their own cultures. Where at one level, both James Joyce and Lucian got, in many ways, great classical educations. But those classical educations prepared them to see the faults in their own society. And when they expose them, people in each culture are shocked. And, and Rob's uh, opening comment seemed to me really great when he said, if you describe one of Lu Xun's stories, either it's one sentence or six pages, it's the same thing with James Joyce's Dubliners. I mean, the first story in Dubliners, Two Sisters, it's like, what's it about? 
well, these two sisters, um, they had a priest living with him. He died. That's all that happens <laughs> in two sisters. But there's all this powerful cultural critique going on in the story. Same thing with Lu Shun. Something very simple is happening, but it's a very powerful critique of his culture. And we're really glad you, you find that connection with Joyce because this is, this is a point that Lee and I hit over and over again in this Lushun series is how important it is to read Lushun alongside writers like Joyce, like Proust, Proust like Kafka. Kafka. Yeah. And like all of them, there's a real – when you mention a love-hate relationship with their cultures, it's intriguing that you have so many memorable characters with whom you really can't sympathize. I find the character of Kong Yiji here – fascinating even though he's utterly pathetic there's nothing in the character that attracts me at all and yet i still want to know more like i finished the story and i thought to myself i kind of wish the story had another five or six pages so i could figure out what where did this guy come from how did he get here was he really dead at the end i mean who knows right so it's fascinating he's so good a writer i think that he can spin you a tale full of almost loathsome characters and at the end you're like wait that was it there's there's something very modernist about all of lucian's work and i i we've been emphasizing in this series he should be interpreted alongside all of these other authors as part of the global modernism movement i definitely think there specifically the fact that there are no heroes in lucian's stories is it reminds me of joyce i mean if you think about ulysses he's taking odysseus who is the more broken and the more interesting of the the heroes from from the uh, you know if you compare the Iliad and the Odyssey, I, I think of Achilles is kind of boring, and there is something very modernist in the way that if you're going to try and have a hero, you have to have a broken hero. But there is this question of can you really even have a hero in a modern era? I think Lushun probably of all of those writers that we've mentioned, Joyce, Proust. Kafka, Lu Xun. I think Lu Xun goes the farthest in questioning the heroic narrative. Maybe he is, in some ways, the greatest of the modernists. I'm, I'm just going to make that claim. <laughs> yeah, no, I think he really, uh, I mean, you know, the, the Nobel Prize in literature is very political. It, certainly in terms of quality, he is in a league with Nobel Prize winning authors. And I, uh, one more author you didn't mention that we might bring into the list would be, uh, I'm not a specialist in Japanese literature, but, uh, Rampo in the Japanese tradition is, is a useful comparison. I often have people in my Chinese, uh, my East Asian literature uh, course, um, have them read both Lu Xun and also some, uh, Mishima Yukio. Um, although the genres are very different, but as examples of figures who are reacting to modernity in different ways, they're kind of interesting comparisons. Professor Van Norden, did you have any final words you wanted to to leave us with? Wise words with which we can go forth and and live our lives like good Confucian scholars or Confucian hating scholars? I don't know which one we should be after reading Konichi. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll just uh, I mean a, maybe a couple of things to to wrap up would be to note that there are three major translations of the writings of Lu Xun. The earliest was by Yang and Yang from the, the Foreign Languages Press in China, and that's available on the Marxist.org website in the public domain now. And then uh, a teacher I knew at Stanford, Lyle, wrote a, translate, a translation of Lucian's stories. It's actually, I think, the best I've ever seen. Um, and that came out, that's Lyle's from University of Hawaii Press. Um, I don't want to step on anybody's toes. I wasn't that excited about Lovell's translation in Penguin Books, which is disappointing because Penguin Books has done some very good translations like D.C. Lao's translations of the Chinese classics. So I think those are all worth looking at. And if you're interested in how these ideas play out in modern China, the Reading the China Dream website has got English translations of contemporary political works by broadly liberal thinkers who are more in the tradition that goes back to people like Hu Xu and Lu Xun, Marxist thinkers, and then also Confucian, contemporary Confucian thinkers. Professor Van Norden, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Uh, if listeners want to learn more about your work, where should they go? Uh, well, thank you very much for having me. I've got a website, brianvannorden.com. My name is difficult to spell, B-R-Y-A-N-V-A-N-N-O-R-D-E-N.com. And that's got links to my Twitter, to my Facebook, and I also have a YouTube channel 
where I've got a bunch of lectures on Chinese philosophy that people can check out. Wow, you're better than us at social media, and we're technically a social media. <laughs> we're, we're supposed to be young and hip and all that, and we yeah, we don't know what we're doing. But anyway, we are on Twitter. You can find us at uh, ChinLitPod. Instagram, we're Chinese Lit Pod, Chinese Literature Podcast at gmail.com. And of course, Patreon, Chinese Literature Podcast. I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast.